let's get started. We have given the best slot, which is just a floor lunch, so I will try to make this fun and moving and all around so you don't fall asleep. So let's see. Yeah. Thanks. And to be fun, I need to move. That's why the hand micro. So we are going to talk about uh, easy access to Presto. Uh, and I we don't have a clicker, so I will do this. The slides are in this link, in just in case you don't want to take photos and around, and then you can do a snapshot or use them. There's public link that's supposed to be open. Wait, if anyone wants uh, to take so a photo. So, so yeah. we wait a few seconds before just going on. Quite easy name, that I'm presto. Yeah. Very obvious. OK, let's move. Uh, there's still people making the photo. People is typing, people okay. is arriving. So. Next. Okay, so before some contest, uh, I'm Albert. Yeah, I'm Iker. He's Albert. The other way around. <laughs> you should do it. Yeah. Nice. Ooh. That was a test, actually. So I have been working with data for some years uh, in the Magister, then GFT, and then in Shifted. And Albert has been working also for some years uh, in Trovit, and then we our history came together like three years ago uh, when he joined shifted, have been there for four years, has been there for three years, and now we are separating our paths. He's going to a new company called Alpha. Uh, don't go to Alpha, go to shifted, we're hiding, just in case it was obvious. And I'm going to shifted, but to slightly to north of the world, so that means Norway, where there is cold and no sun, and uh, beer is 10 euros, so yeah. But, but it's a nice place to be, okay? So, I would like for any talk in any conference to really start with, start with this slide. Yeah, I'm pushing for it. It's like everything I'm telling, I will tell you like that's 100% sure and it works all the time. That's a lie. It works most of the times in our specific case. In your case, it's different. So get the ideas, get the main points, but don't copy paste everything. It may not work. Just a disclaimer on, on this. Okay. So the. Let's just start with where do we come from and where do, why do we need actually to have Presto in place? So we, if you look at that engineering historically, it has been some, some place that um, you ask, you need data in your company and then you ask people, oh, what is the data? And then you go to one team, which normally is the data warehouse team, the BI team, the analytics team, call it whatever, and then you ask them, where is my data? Or I need this data, and they will tell you, this is the data. And now we are moving very fast in this generation, so what we actually want to do is play with this, with this data, touch this data, so we want ownership of this data. And I call this data democracy, so instead of a dictate of this is the data, this is how it looked like, to more like, yeah, data is from the people and from the, for the people, so do whatever I want. And the, the, another way of different, see, uh, different way to see it is, in the past, we used to have these fish and chips. This is your fish. Cook in this way. That's what you get. There's no options. What we want to do in our companies, teach you how to fish. That's more or less the idea. But to, to teach to fish, you need a data lake or a lake or somewhere to fish. And in the very beginning of our data journey, data strategy in Shifted, it looked like this. You get your data, turn back, throw it to your data lake, and wait for results. Wait for some magic to happen, your desires to become true, and as Jesse was saying, like, more money because I have big data. That hasn't been true, and what happened with our users was something like this. Actually, they were looking at the pound saying, where's my money? I found a coin inside. I should get some profit of it. But what is it? And we actually have people saying, I am stupid. I don't know how to use this data. So in order to prevent this, or why it was this happening is, OK, you have your data in your data lake. But you don't have anything else. So you need to actually build the whole thing from scratch. So you will need to build uh, a camp or the tooling or the data warehouse, you need to build everything from scratch. That means if you wanted to do anything with big data, you need obviously a cluster or a big machine. You cannot do it in your laptop. If you have petabytes or terabytes or thousands of 
millions or billions of records. So what was happening is like, okay, so first I need to create a cluster. How do you create a cluster? If you, have, if you are lucky and you have Amazon, you can use an EMR cluster. Okay. Create an EMR cluster. I have to wait it. I have to do it properly. Then I need to connect. Spark console, connect on terminal, keys, okay. Still uh, not so easy, but I can do it. Then you have to put your credentials to access to the S3 data lake. Access keys, exit key. Okay. Copy pasting credentials is not easy. And it's not very safe. Um, okay, now we have our credentials. I'm running my queries, but it doesn't run. I need more machines. Uh, I need to configure this. I need to turn up. So it was actually a very complicated setup. And what was happening is you are basically on a command line doing things. So if the terminal dies and the EMR clusters from time to time, they die, you lost all of your work. So not happy setup. <clears throat> so the first thing we did in Shifted, and that's like the history, then we will get to the tech part. The first thing we did was build something that we called Tableau as a service. We already had Tableau. Tableau was in place, but we joined three different servers into one and we made this project look simple and easy for the people. So we have this dream in the company, and I'm speaking with people, and it looked like a utopia. It's very difficult. The moment I join a company, I have access to the relevant data for my work. So if I work in the finance team, I have access to finance data day one. If you see this left slide, the left part of the slide, this is the Okta button. Okta is a single sign-on that will click, you click there and you go to Tableau. And you, something, you see something like this, a dashboard on your relevant data. Okta is linked to your active directories, Google groups, whatever. So they, you can do something like join this to the group in Google, you join the company in this group, so you have access to that data. That's what we built. And it was nice. That was awesome. You have access to very aggregated data from the first day, and then you could, you could do drag and drop and so on. It's still no democracy, but that's nice. But what happened when you put your data for the first time in a visual way? You see something like this. Data quality. Everything is bad. But that's good, because you realize that your data is bad, and that all this throw the, moin, throw the, coin, into the coin and trying to get value is actually impossible if you don't have good data. You are throwing coins away, but you're not getting value of it because your data is bad. So, next thing, to explore deeply how this data was or why it was bad, you need to go in deep and in, in the data, in the raw data, actually, and see it and visualize and manipulate it more than a table in, in, in Tableau. So we did something that looked quite similar to the Oasis platform from, from Line from yesterday, but we used Jupyter, and we did Jupyter as a service and we put some extra goodies on top. So we put, uh, it will save your code in GitHub automatically. It will create a branch with your user. It will link your user with your Okta user. So now in your data tab, you see, yeah, you have Tableau and also Jupyter. It will link your user with your role with your access, so the data that you actually have access. This, is, this was very, very uh, handy later on with GDPR for example, because you have access only to the data that is relevant to you. And then you, it runs in a shared cluster, so you, can, you don't have to, uh, to start a new cluster. It's one click away, click. That's my notebook. I start, a couple of minutes, run things. And it has, of cost, uh, cost and money reduction thing. Well, okay, if you don't use the cluster, uh, the machine, it dies, and you are not spending money. And you know Jupyter? How many people use Jupyter, Zeppelin, or similar tools here? Okay, so you know the deal. You can do things, graph, ggplot, blah, blah, blah. Funny things. And very important, one second, very important, collaboration. I put it very big. If you share your notebook in GitHub, and the GitHub is public, or if GitHub Enterprise is public for the company, you can actually get this code and say to your colleague, hey, this is what I did. Use it. Copy, paste the code, do a fork on the branch, whatever you want. Use it, and you can reutilize actually the code. You can use this, for example, to say, oh, I'm producing this data, this is how you use it. This is a, a full hands-on example on how to use the data and how to get insights from this data. Use it. So that's something that enables having this kind of things. 
And another thing that we did, and I forgot to mention, is we don't store the content of the notebook. So the data is not stored, it's not in GitHub. That's also very handy when GDPR came, because we don't have to delete actually from GitHub if you by any chance made a query on this user ID. But then this happens. You have the data. Yeah, that's nice, but I want more. I want raw data. No, you have raw data. That's nice, but I don't want to code. So what do analysts, data scientists, people in general, lazy people like me want? SQL. I'm sorry, they just SQL. <laughs> they want it, they ask for it. So you can do something like this is the data that I want from the table that I want with the filters that make sense for me. And this is actually what we are going to provide or what we are, we are providing right now. So the, the big picture, and I will hand over from here to Albert, is we need, we have the data and we have the users. We need to build something in the middle with SQL, preferably with uh, GDBC, to make queries on the data. So actually that's what they did. Okay, so thanks Iker for presenting all the, the journey, you now how we get to uh, provide Presto as a service, no? Iker already explained it. Uh, we started with Tableau, then we go to Jupyter, but at the end there was also some lack of uh, um, skills, no? Not everyone knows Scala, not everyone knows Spark, so we also provide SQL. Because, as he said, no, everyone was asking for that. So we were from having like this, like a S3 magic, no? Some query engine to the people to start figuring out, okay, which parts we need to provide this service properly to our users. Now we have at the middle the query engine. No, it's like a, right now for us it's Presto, but it could be Athena, it could be Redshift Spectrum, it could be whatever, Hive, Impala, query, well, BigQuery, whatever. No? But after some assessment, we choose uh, this one. And also, there are different you know, areas that we have to cover. Now we have the authentication, authorization, I will explain later. Also, we have the traceability. We need to know what is happening no, in, the, in the project, in the system. We need to know the users. We, we need to know which data is being accessed, all the resources that has been used, everything. We need to know it. Also, we have more or less the catalog, no? the, the data, which data is being accessed, or which data I can access. No? So, we started with uh, the authorization of the authentication. At the end, authentication is knowing who is accessing the data. No, we need to figure out who is this user. And then we need to figure out also the authorization, which data we can allow this user to access. For uh, authentication, okay, I, I will ask before to continue, uh, how many people here use Presto or knows about Presto? Okay, how many of you have Presto at production? Well, it's less people. <laughs> so, uh, Presto, um, it's a, before no, it's an open source project provided by Facebook. And it has one thing that is uh, plugins. No? It allows you to develop some plugins and put it inside the, the query engine. No? In this case, it allows you to uh, develop plugins to uh, validate the users, no? to authenticate. The, the most common no, that everyone uses, at least at Redshift or Postgres or everywhere, is that you have a user and you have a password. No? However, we didn't want no, to, to people to, to manage all the users by yourself. No? We have already some solutions in place. You have Jupyter with uh, users and uh, different roles and everything with Amazon. But we wanted to reuse that. So we change it a bit, this uh, password authenticator that is already provided by Presto, to use the Amazon keys. No? So as a user, when you're working with a EMR cluster or with a Jupyter, you have uh, some Amazon keys with the Amazon account key and the secret key. So you use that ones to authenticate yourself. No? You send this like uh, the, the account key no? is the, the user and the secret key is the password. You send it that to Presto. And then we have some AM authenticator that it validates who are, from who are these keys. Now in this case, I send my keys, and then I receive from Amazon when I do a, a call. OK, I, Amazon, I have these keys. Please uh, tell me who is this user, no? who is the one that belongs to these keys. And in that case, it was me. 
No, it, it returns the URM, it returns uh, what was well, the creation date, the password, username, well, some information, no? That if we go then to, to Presto, to, the, to the, the, the UI of Presto, you can see who is accessing the data. No? You, you have a list of the, the latest queries, and instead of having the, the Amazon key, no, that is the, the user, also it provides the principal. Principal is like uh, the user identifier by Presto, that then you can use inside the Presto to do some stuff that I will show later. But here you can see you know, that it has my ERN with the user Albert Franzi. No, it's inside. Also, there is one thing that, it, uh, that we have to use, is a cache. No, we are using a one cache provided already by Guava, by Google Guava. It's quite good. It's the loading cache. And the thing is that Presto is uh, validating every, for every query uh, who is this user. No, if you have a user password, it's validating again and again and again. No, for example, also, uh, it, Presto it supports LDAP. No, I don't know if you are familiar with LDAP. Uh, Okta also have LDAP directories for managing users across different directories. So for every query, it validates again. So it launch a request to the system for validating. Implementing a cache, it allows us to say, OK, during, I don't know, some time of period, it can be one hour or 10 minutes or, I don't know, 24 hours. Please don't validate this user again. No, we don't want to attack every time the, the Amazon. No, like, please validate, validate, validate. No, we avoid that with using this cache. You have here the, the, the wiki from Wava if you want to, to know more about the cache that are already provided by Google Wava. So you don't need to implement yourself. Sometimes there are good libraries itself. So use it instead of coding again everything from scratch. So then I explained it how we manage, we handle the authentication, but also we need to handle the authorization. Now we have the first part that is the I am authenticator. But once we know who is the user, we have a, a role that we attach to them. No, I don't know how many people here is familiar with Amazon. Everyone or these people no, using uh, Azure or other or Google. No, we, we are quite married with uh, Amazon. So we uh, given a user, we attach him a role. And given this role, it has some bucket policies. No, as Iker said before, we have uh, Jupyter in place. This Jupyter, it's, uh, Jupyter user, it has their own role. So for us in Presto, instead of uh, building again you know, the, the system of handling all the authorization, we wanted to reuse things that we are already uh, building at Chipstead. You know, at, the, at the end, when you uh, start building a new product, you don't have to start from scratch for everything. You can try to already reuse good tools that you are already providing in your company. So with this AMR role, we can authorize, authorize the people to access this data or this other one. No, you are from, I don't know, you are from uh, Insights team, and you can only access this data or this data. This is already uh, handled by external tool already provided at Chipstead, so we avoid that. No, in other cases, if you want to use this approach, maybe you can have different S3 buckets. And you say, OK, this user has access to the, these buckets, and this user has another access. So it's a way to handle it instead of coding yourself all the accessing tool again. So then let's move to traceability. I don't know if uh, Datadog guys are here listening. Is any Datadog? Yeah. Hey, it's a really good product. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, in our, in Achieved, we are using uh, Datadog. Also, we are using Prometheus. I'm not going to lie. But uh, Datadog is quite cool. It's quite a great tool. And um, as I said before, we wanted to know all the usage that was uh, being done in Presto. No? We want to know all the users, we want to know all the queries, resources, everything. As I said also, uh, Presto allows to use plugins. No? It, it allows you to put your own plugins inside the, the engine. Here we have the AM Authenticator, is the, the previous one that I explained it, that every time that a user tries to uh, use the system, it, it launches that, it triggers, so you know which user is trying to authenticate. Also you can know well, we lock also uh, which keys are unsuccessful. No? Sometimes maybe it's some user trying to, to use keys that are outdated or that are invalid. No? So we can identify that in our, in our uh, dashboards and monitoring system inside Datadog. Also, uh, by default, uh, Presto allows to define two 
um, plugin. It's Event Listener. It allows you to know when a user is creating a query and when the query is completed, even if it's there any error. And also, we have the system access control that allows you to put another extra layer to know that, uh, to define if a user can access to this table, if can rename columns, if can create views, whatever. No? And I will go in its more detail on its when there's. Can you? So here I have uh, an example of how it looks or code in the system access control. In this case, I'm showing the table access control. No, the, the system access control, it has a lot of uh, methods. It has more or less, I'm not lying, like uh, 100 different uh, methods to, to override. But if you end having 100 methods in the same class, you are going to have a really long class. So we split it in different areas that I will show in the next slide. But here, we have the different methods like check can create table, check can drop table, check can run a table. And in each one, we report a metric to Datadog. Hey, this user is trying to um, create a table. Or this user is trying to drop a table. No? So we act like a man in the middle no? in, the, in Presto, so we know everything. Also, if you want to maybe to drop some features just by default, in the last one, we are denying renaming tables. So it's like, OK, this user is trying to rename table. We are not allowing because we don't want the tables to be renamed. But you can, we are monitoring all of that. Also, uh, as I said before, next slide. Here we have like a, pat a cake pattern. No, we try to split in different areas all the, the methods that uh, Presto allows to override. So we have like uh, the user access things, the catalog things, the schema, table, and the views. No, and we attach one data doc reported inside, so we have all the metrics uh, done by, the, by, by free. Then I would like to, to show the we would like to show the event listener here. As I said before, is uh, logging all the queries created and all the queries completed. In this case, we have the query created, and we know the user, we know the, the source, the catalog that is trying to access the schema, the resources. No, also, in the, when the query is complete, you know if there was any error. You can know all the memory that was used, all the data that was accessed. So you can report all these things to Datadog, and then you can have a great dashboard that shows the usage. This was in the beginning, no, when we were developing and trying that. And we can know all the users that we have, the errors that are happening inside the, the queries. No, if a user is trying to access to some uh, an existing data, or maybe it's querying with uh, some uh, typos or different things. Also, we have uh, all the accesses. We have the, uh, the cluster status. We have uh, different metrics. No? So uh, tracing all the usage is it's great when you are building a new product because it allows you to know which is the, the acceptance no? and also where, is, uh, where we need to put more resources in your development. Then uh, I, we would like to uh, show the continuous integration, continuous deployment. Before that, I would like to ask also uh, how many of you know Spinnaker? Anyone is using Spinnaker? Well, it's just a few. Spinnaker is more or less like a cloud uh, continuous delivery platform where you can have your pipelines to continuous deployment, no? continuous integration, your, your uh, applications or different things. That you have there are different services. So in our case, we have uh, two uh, repos. We have uh, one with uh, what is called Docker Presto DB. It contains the Presto server. There we have our own patches applied there. Also we have the configuration. And when we merge to master, we have a Travis uh, uh, execution that it builds the Docker and it builds a Debian that it push to Artifactory. Also the same with the plugins. No, once we merge to master, we build all together, and then we publish to master, I to, to Artifactory. But then, once this is done, a Spinnaker can, be, uh, can listen to the Travis execution. And once this is done, it can launch a pipeline execution that it will deploy a new cluster for you with the new changes. So it will bake, oh, sorry. It will bake all the, the AMIs, so it's faster to just uh, launch machines. And then it will create some master and then some slaves. 
Also, the good point is that we defined all the configuration that uh, instead of having hard code variables, everything is defined by environment. No? So you can define using the same uh, Presto package, you know, the Presto server that we are uh, delivering, just with a few configurations from the environment, we can define if this machine is a master of is, or if this machine is a slave. Also, if this machine is from production or if it's from staging or which data it can access or different things. That's quite easy. Also, we develop our own uh, template system. It's just a small Python script. If anyone wants it, then they can contact with us and we will provide. It's quite easy. It's just using Jinja. Uh, it helps you know, maybe to manage and uh, avoid to having a, a long uh, script, bash, bash scripts that are evil. And yeah, we are using Spinnaker. So here we are showing you know, how it looks, uh, Spinnaker, the deploy configuration. We have right now, we have a production and a staging. And then we have the slaves for production and the slaves for staging, you know, for, for trying, for development. And this configuration is only the, the one that we are applying to the master machine. It's quite simple, it's quite easier to change, and it's quite easier to maintain. Now we have the version that we are using. We are right now in the 0204. We are, uh, where is the home? We are discovering the host. Since it's master, it's local host, it's the same. You need to put the DNS. And then it's the coordinator because it's the master. And uh, we are assuming a role that is the, the one that is allowing to access the Metastore that I will explain in the next uh, slide. And then we have, for example, the authentication type. Here is the password but you can change it to LDAP or another ones provided by yourself. You can define the ones that you want. And the Amazon account where you are uh, working on. This allows us uh, to, the, to allow only users that are from the, your account, no? because otherwise you can have uh, valid keys trying to access your cluster. And if you say, OK, this key is valid, but it's not from my account, I don't want it. So it's what we are doing here. Finally, you know, the, the, the glue. Um, Presto, more or less, it was based uh, on top of Hive, or it was like a taking into account Hive. You know, uh, uh, Presto and Hive use a uh, Metastore. The Hive Metastore is where all the schemas and tables are defined. You know, it says where you can access. And uh, the good thing is that uh, Amazon is providing also a, a Metastore. It's called Glue. No, and the, the, the good point about using a remote uh, Metastore without requiring to do anything is that you can reuse it for your different projects and your different systems. You can have one Hive there, one Presto. You can have one Redshift Spectrum. You can have whatever you want that use a Metastore. And you can reuse it the same one for everyone. You don't need to have different Metastores. You only maintain one, and then everyone use the same. And it's quite simple because you just say you're using a Glue Metastore, you say the region, and this is one patch, one pull request that we do to the open source that allows you to assume a role for your machine. So you know that this machine is only assuming a role that can access to this uh, Metastore instead of opening to everyone. Then we have a synchronizer. No, the idea is that uh, uh, when you put data to S3, no, you want to access to this data. No, and uh, we have partitions per day or per hour. And uh, as Hive, Impala, or Presto, you need to define the partitions manually. No, you need to say, OK, now this uh, hour appeared in S3, please add it to this table so you can query it. So instead of doing that manually, we have one project that where we define all the catalog, no, all the metastore in a DynamoDB. So we can put everything there. And after every hour or every day, we run it uh, with a cron job. We don't put it manually. And then we just execute, we synchronize this uh, Metastore, the Hive Metastore, where we say, this is our, the new partitions. This is our, the new uh, path that you can read. Also, we have some tables that are like, OK, this table will have the latest 90 days or the latest seven days of data. No, because as you know, uh, well, S3 is more or less cheaper. No, but if you allow some data analyst or some data scientist to access data, they will try to access all the data that they can. No, and then the data scientists can come to you and say, hey, this query is taking, I don't know, hours. And you say, OK, let's see what are you trying to access. I'm trying to access two years of user behavior data. And you say, whoa, that's more than petabytes. And you only have four machines. So sometimes you need to limit this by providing tables that only have the latest 
90 days or the latest 30 days. You know? So having this synchronizer allows us to provide this. You know? We are providing the latest uh, data available, so we avoid these uh, crazy queries trying to access all the S3. This also, uh, well, this is how we, uh, we manage, no? we synchronize, no? we create the missing schemas, we create the missing tables, we update the existing tables. If there is any table that uh, one column was renamed, was dropped, or something else, no? or the type was changed, was fixed, and then we just synchronize the, the, the partitions that we needs to be added. This also, it's uh, the good point, is that, uh, well, it can be used, as I said, no, the, the Metastore can be used by Athena, Presto, Hive, all of them together, so you just uh, abstract yourself from the, the query engine that you're using. Now. Okay, all, so, this, every, all this is very good, Albert, this, this is perfect, it's super fine, good technology, continuous integration, continuous deployment, but what happens when you do a lot of engineering and you get your perfect super car, super tool, but you don't have actually fuel to run it. This is, you have to sell your car to buy petrol or diesel, or you have to, I don't know, sell your Tesla to buy some electricity, that's the new thing. So actually, there's a very important thing, fundamental, so this project works, and that's the data. So what we may be building, you may think, no, what you are building is a Ferrari. You are building a Ferrari, it will go super fast, it will be the best car ever. Then thinking that what we are building actually is a Skoda Yeti. So has anyone seen this chapter from uh, Lucar? No. So th this is a race, an actual race that they made. They put a Ferrari and a Skoda on a race. Who wins? Who do you think that Ferrari will win? Raise your hands, please, the Ferrari fans. Okay, who thinks the Skoda will win? Okay, then click. You need to know your data to know which one of the tools is faster. So all these fancy benchmarks, sorry for the vendors here, so all, all these fancy benchmarks on my vendor tool is the best tool ever, is true with their data. So remember the first slide, it's true with their data, not with your data. So what we actually have in Shifted, click please, is something like this. This is our data, a tiny extract, a snapshot of it. So you may think, oh, this nice data, a structure, yeah, have some, some things. But for example, you find things like this one. The object ID top is an integer. And tomorrow someone changes and put a new string. You created two tab your table saying this column is a number, and you get a string. What happens? Your query doesn't work. You created also your column thinking that it was a string. Okay, then the number will also fit. But now it's suddenly an object it also breaks. Or you have these funny things that you didn't think about, and this, this is why you need a DBA, I know where it's Jesse, but this is why you need a DBA. Don't never use the add symbol, because it's not valid for Abro, and don't never use the that, because what happens when you write this in a database? He will make a minus between two columns. If you have worked with databases, you know this. If you have worked with Kafka, maybe not. Sorry for the Kafka guys, but. Trust the DBAs, they know something about this. Okay. We also have this missing thing. So you may think, okay, but Presto, Athena runs on Presto. You're basically copying the login for Athena. You're copying things from Athena. Why, why don't you use Athena directly? We use also Athena. But it doesn't always work. So something like a schema evolution, something that Jesse was also mentioning, you need to, your, change, your data will change from day to day. If you need to do queries for the last month of data, and it changes every day, you need the schema evolution, so you can define this with some um, configuration with Presto. Click, please. And this is funny, because Presto is case sensitive. So the ID is uppercase here, and the other way is lowercase. So if you run the query simply, it will say, oh, you have two ID columns. Which one is the one you want to query? This is real life, this happens. So you have to explicitly say, no, this is the configuration. Um, ignore uppercase or lowercase, just use any. Yeah, both are the same column. But you have to say this. This is the good thing on Presto. You can configure this. That is some work, but you can configure this. With other tools, I don't know. Maybe yes, maybe not. Schema evolution with Athena, no, for example. And that was a no on using it, although you can do something else that I will explain in the next slide. 
Oh, and then you have this schema here, yeah, uh, completely wrong data. Ignore this. Everything breaks. <coughs> so, for example, one thing that you have to do is okay, a schema, a schema governance. How do we do the schema? How do, 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 do we define the schema? Well, this is an ongoing discussion for your whole life. Something that you could do, something that you could do, and it doesn't always work, is have kind of a contract. So you have hard contract, soft contract, eh, contract. Something, some things are hard. For example, the event ID, choo, choo, back, back. Oh, then, spoilers. Event ID is, is very important. You have to have a unique identifier from, from the source. So you, you need to have a provider. Why do you need to have a provider in a multi-tenant solution? What happens if you store together and give access to the database of two different sites to the same guy that shouldn't have access? These four letters is the answer. GDPR, you cannot store together this data. It has to be somehow separated or by logic or by structure or by technology or by physically or by all of those. So you need to know where the data comes from to separate it and don't mess with this. Don't do any data leak or, or get cocked in this. Timestamp, always, uh, and the type. But the type is recommended. If you don't have the type of your event, it's not so important. Then you have the object. The object is not always mandatory. But if, you, if the object is mandatory, then you need an ID. This is kind of something to know. And then you may have other columns that you send just in case, like the ref version 2 with underscore, please. This is something that, yeah, you, you may send it. But we need to be able to ignore it. And you need to do it in the proper way so it doesn't break all everything else. OK? So the, the thing in my right. Yes, right? Is the physical layer. It's how the event is stored physically. And I think in my left, it can be a physical layer if you choose to. But it's actually the logical layer. So if you are DBA, you will say, oh, this is a view. This is a view on the table. Select these fields from the, from the data. And it, it's actually a view. But something that you can do if you have this physical from the logical separated is you can evolve this very fast. So you can define this, and if tomorrow you need another field inside the object, because you want another dimension in your tables or whatever, you can actually do this without touching the data. And if you have a schema evolution and the data is null, you will ignore the old data, put nulls there, but it will still work. <coughs> and if you just want to do some data quality tracking basic, you can do this with the mandatory fields and ignore the rest. And you can see something like, OK, how is the adoption of my tracker evolving in different versions. This is the very basic thing that we did. Uh, I think it was the first thing we did when, when we got uh, access to the, all this data. Tracking the version evolution and see, OK, the data is 90% in this version of the SDK, which was wrong, so we need to change it, or we need to do this, or we need to change the code. So that's something that you can do. The good part is that you, again, physical, uh, logical. You don't need to rewrite everything. You can evolve the things in the, in the left, you can keep adding fields in the right, and there shouldn't be an impact. But you can say, yeah, but if I actually have a physical data set smaller, I can uh, adapt it to my needs. I can change from parquet to JSON, from parquet to CSV, don't do that, uh, to XML, don't do that, to ORC, maybe. So you can actually change. Yeah, as said, you choose. If you have the opportunity to not write the data, you have some advantage. If you write it, you have some others, but think before doing. So I will leave the wrap up for. I can do it from here. No. So uh, just to wrap up, now we have uh, three valuable points that we would like to, sh to share. No, after all this presentation, explaining all the schema hell, all the how we manage no to configure Presto and how to at the end we were able to access S3 data. No. So uh, the first uh, valuable point it was that accessing S3 data by using SQL, it was like uh, valuable. No, it was perfect. No, people, uh, business analysts, people, uh, product analysts, they were able to, to access the raw data no, and to start creating value from, from zero, no, from the first minute. And was that, that was great. Also, uh, all the, the configuration and all the manual thing that we end uh, doing with Presto, all the, the configuration, it was quite easy. No, it was not difficult at the end. You just uh, there is a good documentation to to read. Then uh, you just put in your hands on there, and then after that, it's quite uh, 
well, you end having the cluster. Like, um, it was like a two months, more or less, of development, so it was not a really difficult uh, job to do. However, you need people to do it, no? As we said, we, uh, at the beginning, we discard Athena, no? Because it doesn't handle very well the schema evolution, but uh, if we don't have enough people to maintain this app, then maybe you need to go to some serverless uh, option like Athena, no? Because at the end, this, the, the Presto cluster needs maintenance, needs people behind, no? Uh, like uh, 24 hours up and running, you need to have alerts. Also, at the end, no, all this uh, crappy data that uh, Iker explained, no, all this schema hell that we have at Shifted, no, that is uh, when you end collecting data from different countries, from different uh, companies, in the same place, you end having a different uh, format, different uh, type fields, uh, different names, also using reserved characters, no, like the slash or uh, semicolons inside the field name. So uh, there is no, uh, magic tool to solve that. No, it's a challenge, but uh, even if you choose an one or another one, you will, I'm sure that you will face the same issue. No? So, just uh, before ending, we would like to share some uh, links of interest. No? Some of them are uh, Medium articles that uh, both of us uh, wrote before, explaining uh, why we choose Presto and uh, how we develop all uh, the Presto solution. And we would like to recommend to, uh, if you like uh, Presto or you are planning to use it in the future, I recommend you to subscribe to the Starburst Data uh, Newsletter. No, it's uh, one of the companies behind uh, Presto, quite active. So uh, they share, I think it's monthly uh, newsletter about what is going on. So I will really recommend to subscribe there. And let's, once say that, let's move to, to questions. Hi guys, thank you. Um, how big is the team that was working on this and how much time did it take you to build it? Oh, how much the <laughs> so the, the, to make this happen, we joined the two teams, two people from two teams. And, and it was fun. It was started in March, April. So we were four guys in the squad, uh, and they, we divided, we did the benchmark, everyone took one, and then we did the, the setup, we did this microsystem kind of split, we work on different parts. Uh, then it was April, uh, GDPR is coming, GDPR is coming, Hokong needs to work on this, okay, so we are three guys. Uh, two weeks later, GDPR is coming, GDPR is coming, so we are two guys. Um, so yeah, you get the idea. So it, it's not that you need to do a lot of work. It, uh, you have to, to get in the plugins and in the patches, you have to do some, some learning. Uh, but it's, it's not much work. And maintaining the cluster, actually, is, is just me, <laughs> somehow. But it works fine with the, with the load that we have of users. And having something like uh, Spinnaker, continuous integration, continuous deployment, actually, and, or EL, ELB, elastic load balancer, in, in Amazon actually helps because if you see a machine down, it recovers. If it doesn't recover, you recover it, and it's kind of easy to restart the whole thing. Uh, it's not, it's not a, um, in the critical path, this service. So let's say if something is broken, it will take a couple of days to, to fix it. But the actual problem is that most of the times people say, it's broken, and we go out and say, yeah, it's the data, sorry. So that's a, a deal breaker. We are trying to get into this, and also in parallel, we, for, for many of the data sets, you can use also Athena, because I said, you can just use Athena. We cannot forbid people from using Athena. It's, I mean, it's, they are in the, in the IAM role, you can actually use it, so they can use both, and, and it depends. If, if something is, uh, is not working in, in Presto and it's working in Athena, we don't say stop, but, so we have both. But actually, with the current flexibility of the data and for this very big data, uh, you can only do these kind of things with, with Presto, so yeah. Uh, two guys and one in maintenance right now. Just follow up question. Uh... How many analysts or how many users of, uh, of the platform and how big is the cluster? Just 
The, the cluster is six machines. It's M3 X large. Thank you. Yeah. M3 X large. Six machines, mas plus the master, or seven actually, because we sometimes we try to put one more or one less. But it's around six, seven. And then the, the analyst using it actually right now, I think it's between 12, 10 daily active users. So it's not very intensive thing. But we have some dashboards also, which was like a, because of our non-negotiable GDPC, it has to have GDPC. We have, we have some dashboards, so there is, there is actual use through dashboards, which is also nice. 